Hello, and welcome to this launch of our new task force on U.S.-China policy report, China's New Direction, Challenges and Opportunities for U.S. Policy. I'm Mary Kay Magstad, Associate Director of Asia Society's Center on U.S.-China Relations. The Center and the 21st Century China Center at UC San Diego's School of Global Policy and Strategy convened the task force and its work on this report. The task force is a group of 21 leading China specialists and scholars in or from the United States, including those on this panel. The task force was convened in 2015 to better understand how China is changing and how the US-China relationship is shifting under Xi Jinping's leadership. It also looks at what this means or could mean for US interests and how US policymakers might respond. This new report takes up these questions and offers a way forward. Each section deals with a specific aspect of the US-China relationship, such as military, technology, economy, and human rights. And each section reflects the views of its co-authors. So rather than this being a consensus report, it presents a range of views from deeply experienced China specialists. Here's a brief introduction of those here with us. Charlene Barshevsky is chair of Parkside Global Advisors. She was US trade representative under President Clinton and chief US negotiator of China's agreement to join the World Trade Organization. Winston Lord was assistant secretary of state for East Asian and Pacific Affairs under President Clinton. He was US ambassador to China under President Reagan. And 50 years ago this year, he accompanied Henry Kissinger on a secret trip to Beijing that helped open up US-China relations and led to President Nixon's historic visit to China the following year, which Winston Lord also joined. He is chairman emeritus of the International Rescue Committee. Evan Medeiros is a professor and chairs the Asia, the Asia Studies Department at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. He served on the National Security Council under President Obama, first as director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia Affairs, then as senior director for Asia Affairs. The task force's co-chair, Susan Shirk, has a long history engaged with China from her first visit there in 1971 to serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State under the Clinton administ administration with responsibility for China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Mongolia. She is now chair of the 21st Century China Center and a research professor in the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, or UC, San Diego. And Orville Schell, the task force's other co-chair, has been engaged with China for more than half a century as a journalist, author, analyst, advocate, and convener. Throughout that time, Orville has been committed to helping people, especially Americans, better understand China's history, culture, and ambition, and the challenges and opportunities China's rise over the past few decades present for the US and for the world. Orville directs the Center on US-China Relations at, at Asia Society. Orville will kick us off in a moment by audio only, and we'll then go to Susan as co-chair, and then to Charlene Barshevsky, Winston Lord, and Evan Medeiros in that order, to talk about challenges and opportunities in particular dimensions of the current US-China relationship. This session is also a press conference. Journalists are joining us via Zoom and are welcome to submit written questions at any time through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We'll get to those questions after we hear from each of our panelists. The entire session will be an hour long. Orville, over to you. Well, thanks, Mary Kay. And, and uh, I have to say it's a, a, a great pleasure to be with um, some of our colleagues from the task force in US-China relations that um, has been really generously supported since its inception by uh, the Carnegie Corporation. And I think, you know, at a moment like this, more than ever, uh, to have a, a through train group that does meet continuously, has a certain comfort level and honesty with each other, is particularly important because we are in effect inventing, reinventing the uh, format for the US-China relationship as, as China changes rapidly, becomes more powerful, more wealthy, and more aggressive. So um, I welcome this session. Um, I, I regret to say that um, I think there are uh, more challenges than opportunities uh, to borrow a, a, a part of our title at this particular moment. Uh, and uh, I think our uh, effort this time around has analyzed both. Uh, so uh, I look forward to hearing the comments of my uh, colleagues. And now let me turn it over to my uh, uh, co-chair and, and, and friend and colleague, Susan Shirk. 
Thank you, Orville. Well, as China scholars and uh, practitioners in uh, U.S.-China relations, I th this uh, iteration of our task force work is based on the notion that China is not a monolith and that in order to compete effectively and to stabilize the relationship so the two countries don't blow one another up, um, we really need to dig deep into what is going on inside China. Um, and of course, it's increasingly difficult to figure that out because of COVID, because uh, travel between the two countries is much less frequent, um, and because the relationship has turned not just competitive, but to a certain extent adversarial. Um, so one of the questions that motivates our work in looking inside China and trying to understand it in a more in-depth and nuanced manner um, is that the question of how much of a threat and what kind of a threat is China to the United States? Uh, we don't want to overestimate or underestimate that and understanding the Chinese system internally is an important part of trying to answer that question. The other big question that motivated me and I think many of the other participants in the project is the big question of whether or not we think we can still influence China's choices through um, communication, through our own actions, and even possibly through negotiation. Um, and this question of is China influenceable through diplomacy really comes to the fore because the Chinese political system and now is one with much more concentrated centralized power in the hands of Xi Jinping. And uh, when you get a more centralized system, uh, it's uh, more unpredictable, maybe more capricious, and uh, the information flow may not be uh, accurate. In other words, because of the pressure on officials to demonstrate their loyalty to Xi Jinping, they may be reluctant to give him frank and accurate information about what is the backlash or the costs of certain policies, both domestically and internationally. So the question of how China's system is impacting its actions and behavior and the prospects for diplomatically trying to uh, stabilize the relationship and influence China's choices is one that looms very large in our minds. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Charlene Barshevsky, who will talk about the economic and technology sections of the report. Thank you very much, uh, Susan and Orville. Thank you uh, as well. Uh, and good afternoon to uh, all of you. Three major features of China's economy are relevant to US uh, policymakers. First, China's principal growth strategy is state-led, involving large-scale intervention in the economy to achieve rapid technological progress, increase self-sufficiency in key technologies, and dependence on foreign suppliers, and achieve global leadership in many technology sectors. The 14th five-year plan represents a doubling down on the drive for independence, calling science and technology self-sufficiency, a pillar of national development, and committing China to massive subsidies for commercial technology and applications. This and prior vast amounts of concessional finance 
are complemented by such things as the use of Communist Party committees in private enterprise to influence commercial decisions, uh, use of anti-monopoly uh, laws and other regulations to either uh, encourage or force technology transfer, and discrimination against foreign entities. The active decoupling of supply chains from dependence on the U.S., triggered in part by U.S. sanctions, uh, is explicitly coupled with a drive to increase the dependency of the U.S. and third countries on China's suppliers and markets to, among other things, also explicitly stated, to increase China's leverage. The corrosion of fair competition and market-determined outcomes brought about by China's tech and development agenda affects companies both inside and outside of China. Beijing's policy of civil-military fusion adds further complexity and challenge. Second, China remains conditionally more open to foreign investment, relaxing restrictions, most notably in finance, pharmaceuticals, and automobiles. These openings, which are in tech-heavy sectors, are generally areas where China either lags but hopes to catch up or wishes to best the competition. That is, China's investment opening today is driven by the state's industrial and technology policy aims. Even so, China is viewed as integral to corporate strategies and not an optional feature of the global economy. Having said this, the latest U.S.-China Business Council survey shows that while companies remain highly committed to the China market and in general very profitable there, they are increasingly worried about the impact of Chinese industrial policy and US-China tensions on their longer term prospects. Third, China's economy faces persistent financial risk given the explosive ratio of gross debt to GDP amassed by local jurisdictions to finance infrastructure and by both state-owned and private companies in favored industrial sectors. Tighter credit policies and other efforts to contain leverage will require harder budget constraints, but we believe it is unlikely that these constraints will substantially forestall China's state-driven tech agenda. There is arguably an innovation risk that arises from China's ongoing crackdown uh, on technology and other companies, and what appears to be a growing disregard for private business and private capital. But the longer term impacts of these sharp pivots in policy have yet to be determined. A framework for response by the US should be premised on maintaining the US lead in scientific research, discovery and application. The US response should not wait for China to slow down. The US response uh, should not assume that China will adopt economic efficiency over perception of national security. The U.S. response should not assume that inward investment into China will slow uh, or that China will lack interest on the part of foreign companies worldwide. Nor should the U.S. assume that China's Belt and Road Initiative, particularly its uh, digital Silk Road aspect, the build out of 5G will fail. The U.S. shouldn't assume that China will be unsuccessful in setting technology standards for the future. The U.S. should not assume that uh, China's burgeoning ties with the uh, developing world and with middle income countries will fall short. Rather, Chinese interests and actions will constantly intersect and sometimes collide with those of the United States. And it will be the job of US policymakers to decide which areas of intersection pose national security risks and which do not, and thus should remain undisturbed. Which technologies it can share with China and which it shouldn't. Which emerging technologies the US and close partners need to dominate 
and which are of less concern. To the maximum extent possible, the U.S. should develop clear rationales and guidelines for the assessment of national security interests. As a general matter, we believe the response to China should be to foster rather than diminish our open, attractive, and powerful innovation environment and U.S. scientific dynamism. The U.S., in addition, should increase government funding for R&D in critical sectors and in advanced production facilities, rebuild relevant infrastructure, invest in smart infrastructure, increase participation in tech standards bodies to influence the future rules of the road, enact immigration policies that cement the U.S. as the most attractive destination for foreign talent, and work in concert with varying groups of like-minded countries, including on cybersecurity, data privacy, and data management. The U.S. should also join CPTPP as the single most effective way to respond to China's growing regional and global economic influence. An agreement on digital technology issues should also be pursued, as well as a trade compact among industrialized countries based on market economics, rule of law, and transparency in areas not covered or only poorly covered by the WTO. And last, the U.S. should reopen negotiations with China on specific issues to better ensure a more equitable and reciprocal internal market for foreign companies, and in general, to keep the heat on. Thank you. Okay, over to Winston Lord, please. Thank you, it's good to be with all of you. In the five minutes I have for a huge topic, I will focus on policy recommendations rather than the extensive analysis in the report, which is crucial. And I'll probably have to speak at New York speed. Uh, in about a year from now, the party Congress, Xi Jinping, looks to cement his unhindered and untenured leadership role in China. And as they move toward that milestone, China's foreign policies have become increasingly thuggish and belligerent. And the report has many ways in which we feel we can respond to that. But meanwhile, at home, we've seen an unleashing of a comprehensive campaign of repression, control, regulation, and indoctrination across the political, economic, and cultural sections. And countering these trends would be infinitely more complex and difficult. And it also raises the question, what is the source of Xi's paranoia? Does he see vulnerabilities in Chinese society that we don't? Now, China is extremely complex, and no aspect is more complex than trying to gauge public opinion or support for the regime. But all indications are that Xi and the Communist Party have broad backing because of economic advance, nationalism, handling of the COVID crisis, indoctrination. And these facts, plus repression and surveillance, says that there will be little prospect of any significant change on Xi's policies or the Communist Party domination. But the report gives many examples of continuing diversity and dynamism in Chinese society. As Susan said, it is not monolithic. And the long arc of history is not determined yet with respect to China's political, social, economic orientation. Thus, the report puts forth suggestions of a nuanced policy requiring for a foreign exchange with China and promoting our values uh, with respect to democracy and human rights, which should be universal values, we stress, not just America. Now, the single most crucial task of responding to this uh, landscape is to get our own act together with respect to hard and soft power. If so, we can compete with China across the board, including models of governance, of governmental uh, control of society. Uh, the report describes how the Communist Party is now dominating all sectors, and it also describes the regulations and crackdowns on business, media, education, civil society, and culture. In response, we believe that we should be using scalpels, not machetes, with respect to these various 
issues. That some distinction and nuance is required, even as Charlene has pointed out. And specifically, we call for a presidential statement encouraging academic and cultural exchange with China, a voice for American education leaders in our shaping of our policy, restoring visa access for Chinese students, clarifying to U.S. universities what the security concerns about China's petition participation consists of, supporting Chinese language study in the U.S., restoring the Fulbright and Peace Corps programs, negotiating reciprocal visa agreements with journalists, improving and emphasizing public diplomacy, and increasing exchanges in civil society in non-sensitive areas. In brief, again, as my predecessors have suggested, we should remain open and attract Chinese talent while promoting openness in China itself. Now, with respect to the values section, the human rights and democracy of the report, the report lays out, of course, uh, the extensive repression that I've mentioned and has been documented by the State Department and many other NGOs. The crackdown is not only on opposition, but perceived disloyalty. There's a danger they're moving back to the Mao era where you don't even have the right to silence that you have to demonstrate uh, your loyalty. And there's a new and even more dangerous trend, uh, the extension of ideological control beyond China's borders, whether it's surveillance, foreign agents, uh, pressure on Chinese students and scholars, punishing American business, media and scholars who are critical of China, taking hostages in China to pressure other governments, et cetera. Whatever the causes for this crackdown and the paranoia perhaps behind it, there's little our policy can do, frankly, to influence Chinese domestic political system. But our report nevertheless says we should persist in promoting, again, universal, not just American values and human rights, lays out the reasons uh, for doing so. Moreover, we believe that promoting human rights will not prevent China from cooperating on issues which are in its own self-interest. And I would add that on the Chinese transnational human rights abuses, we must be especially vigilant and firm. It is one thing when, violate, when Beijing violates the rights of its own citizens in its own country. It's another when they violate those of other citizens in other countries. And here I'd recommend a prescient Asia Society Hoover Institution report in 2018, which addresses this issue. Finally, with respect to policy recommendations in this area, it's above all imperative that the U.S. live up to its own standards and values here at home. And then there are six or seven major areas we recommend. We should call out China's human rights violations in public diplomacies at the U.N. and elsewhere, but again, promoting universal values, not just Western or American ones. There should be government and private sector report uh, <clears throat> for Chinese reformers in China and in exile, including support for the increased support for the National Endowment for Democracy, Voice of America, Radio Free Asia, technology to circumvent China's great firewall of censorship and providing asylum to those at risk. We should rejoin or devote more resources to international bodies on human rights and democracy. We should collaborate with fellow democracies, including at summits, G7, G20, et cetera. We should work with the US business community to raise human rights awareness. And finally, we should nurture people to people exchanges, except in areas that are particularly sensitive. Thank you. Thank you, Winston Lord. And finally, over to Evan Medeiros. Well, thank you very much. Um, I wanna begin by expressing extraordinary gratitude to Orville Schell and Susan Shirk uh, for their vision and their leadership on this important task force. Because what we're talking about today is not just one report. Of course, there's lots of reports that clog up our inbox, but rather an initiative that goes back to 2017. This is, in fact, the third report since this project was announced in 2017. And the sixth report overall, we have side reports that have been done on values, on technology, and on transatlantic cooperation. 
So really what we're celebrating today is an enterprise. Uh, it's an enterprise that involves America's leading China specialists who are all trying to understand the changing nature of the China challenge. As Susan rightly pointed out, China is not a monolith, but of course that's not new. We've known that for quite a while and the more China opened up, the greater diversity that we saw inside uh, the country. But more than the issue of monolith is China's dynamism. And it's the, re the, the accelerated pace of change that's occurring in Chinese politics, in Chinese economics, and what I'm going to talk about today, Chinese military affairs and Chinese foreign policy. And it's that rapid pace of change, it's that dy dynamism and that interaction that we decided to capture in our third report. And this third report is unlike the previous two insofar as it's not actually focused on US-China relations per se. We got America's leading specialists together on economics, politics, culture, you know, foreign policy, technology to understand what's going on within China. And then of course, what the implications are for the United States and recommendation and recommendations for that. So really what this report is, is a quick one-stop shop um, that's a snapshot by America's leading China specialists to understand those arenas of China that are changing most rapidly. And that is an extraordinary accomplishment uh, in particular because it was done relatively quickly. So this is a very up-to-date document. Um, and I think it uh, offers some very interesting prescriptions on policy. Now I've been asked to cover military affairs and foreign policy, two very large chunky pieces of business. Uh, so let me uh, attempt to do that briefly. I'll begin by talking about China's military challenge, the PLA. Uh, I was not one of the authors on this chapter, but the authors are literally the dream team. Tom Christensen, Zach Cooper, General Carl Eikenberry, Taylor Fravel, Bonnie Glazer. There's really no better group of people that you would want looking at the national security dimensions of the China military challenge. And they're quite clear that for U.S. defense planners, China's military modernization poses the single greatest challenge um, to the United States in international security affairs. Now, while China is not a global military peer competitor of the United States and won't be for decades, uh, it has developed and continues to develop a very robust ability to fight uh, within the first island chain. And it has done so by effectively undermining previously the key attributes of American power projection. Uh, so US military presence and the ability to project and sustain military power is very much threatened in East Asia because of the strides China has made. This chapter highlights a variety of capabilities of particular concern to the United States. Number one, long range strike weapons, including anti-ship and ballistic missiles. Number two, China's integrated air defenses, uh, which limit the ability for the US to operate immediately around China's coastline, especially off of Taiwan. Three, China's electronic warfare, cyber warfare and counter space capabilities, which the PLA is using to establish information dominance in the Asia theater, making it very difficult for US forces to communicate with each other and with allies um, in a notional conflict. And four is gray zone activities, uh, in particular China's use of its Coast Guard and its mar maritime militia to advance its, um, uh, its maritime territorial claims. The group uh, concludes with, this chapter concludes with um, six important policy recommendations. First, the United States has to build and rely on a more agile set of capabilities in East Asia. In particular, that means diversifying the footprint of US uh, forces. Number two, the US must develop a larger inventory of long range strike weapons beyond the reach of this very sophisticated 
uh, integrated air defense system that the PLA has developed. Three, the U.S. must disperse forward deployed material and ensure better cybersecurity logistics lines. In other words, for the United States to have the ability to sustain a conflict, it need, needs a greater degree of pre, pre-positioned supplies. Four, the U.S. should help to improve partner capacity in the South China Sea. In other words, improving the capacity of our partners, Coast Guards and Naval capabilities so they're less subject to coercion and predation by China, especially China's use of gray zone capabilities. Five, the U.S. should conduct strategic dialogues on crisis management uh, with China to prevent crises from immediately and rapidly escalating. Six, finally, the U.S. must strengthen Taiwan's defense capability uh, against invasion and coercion. So on the military front, the challenge is substantial, and there's a lot of work to do uh, regarding um, uh, regarding uh, options and uh, policy recommendations. Now, let me switch gears from the military uh, issues to Chinese diplomacy. Uh, I worked on this chapter along with uh, my colleagues, Taylor Fravel and Bonnie Glazer. We begin with the premise that China seeks regional preeminence and global prominence to cement its global presence and influence across all dimensions of military power, diplomatic, economic, uh, military, and informational. Um, At the same time, China seeks to minimize the constraints, especially from the United States, and maximize its ability to protect its perceived interests to ensure access to global markets, capital and technologies, and gain respect for its government uh, governance choices. Even though there's a lot of discussion nowadays, especially in light of the publication of recent books about China's global aspirations, we were very much focused on China's diplomacy in Asia because our contention is that China is and will remain, I'm sorry, Asia is and will remain China's most immediate foreign policy priority. China will seek to develop and then sustain a dominant position in Asia by advancing its sovereignty claims, deepening the region's economic dependence on China, neutralizing potential rivals, especially American allies and partners, and encouraging, including through using economic and information diplomacy, political deference by Asian countries on issues important to China. The chapter then goes on to look at a variety of Chinese diplomatic tools, China's relationships um, with key countries in the region. And what we found is that um, in particular, perhaps the area of greatest dynamism is in the toolkit that China brings to advancing its vision for Asia and for thinking more about establishing greater presence globally. Our view is that China has more than ample and diverse material capabilities than ever before, which enable a very activist posture. For example, China has more diplomatic posts in the world than any other country, including the United States. But we highlight the fact that economic instruments are China's most common and effective tool of statecraft, but China also increasingly leverages its propaganda and information networks, including disinformation, to pursue its diplomatic goals. And of course, many of you on the call will be familiar with um, China's wolf warrior diplomacy. China actively uses these for both deliberate and misinformation efforts in order to advance Chinese narratives, such as about the origins of COVID. Now, there are other areas where China's capabilities have been more limited to date, such, such as its military to military diplomacy. But our view is that the Chinese diplomat is not an 800 pound gorilla, uh, but rather uh, Xi Jinping's very activist diplomacy has generated some international blowback. Positive views of China in regions have rapidly declined. States in Asia and uh, more broadly, including in Europe, are beginning to increase cooperation to counter China such as in the first ever Leaders Summit of the Quad in, the March, in March of 2021, as well as in recent uh, U.S. meetings in Europe, the G7, NATO, the U.S.-EU Summit. Um, 
Nevertheless, it's very premature to conclude that China is going to respond in a conciliatory manner to this blowback and pushback. Uh, but rather, the Chinese will continue to assert themselves in order to show strength and confidence at home, especially um, following the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party's founding, but also in the lead up to the 20th Party Congress in 2022. The report ends with five very solid recommendations that largely are about um, how the United States need to re- needs to revitalize itself at home, needs to rebuild its relationships uh, abroad. The U.S. needs to um, think more about creative uh, diplomatic co- cooperation, not just with China, but multilaterally uh, in areas that um, you know, align with global interests related to climate change, public health, and nonproliferation. Um, America needs to reinvest in the infrastructure of American diplomacy to ensure that American Foreign Service officers uh, abroad are attentive to and uh, capable of uh, addressing the variety of challenges posed by China to American interests far from Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. So with that, let me turn it back to you, Mary Kay. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. And I believe that our co-chairs are going to use the co-chair prerogative to ask uh, a couple of questions themselves of the panelists. Uh, Orville, would you like to go first? Sure. So listen, I want to ask you all, um, who is decoupling faster, the United States or China? And where should we decouple and where shouldn't we? And is there an end game here? Maybe start with you, Charlene, and then uh, maybe Evan for the just the diplomatic side of that one. You're, you're, muted. you're yeah. muted. Thank you. I think it's uh, fair to say that China has actually been decoupling from the West for quite some time in small increments through various policies uh, and steps that it has taken along the way. The desire for technological independence, which is the key, uh, sort of a key driver uh, of the economy and is viewed as the key driver of the future economy, has been going on now since roughly 2006 with the inauguration of China's indigenous innovation campaign. And that campaign in turn spawned the designation of strategic economic industries and the Made in China 2025 and uh, all of the various programs since, including, as I said in my remarks, the 14th five-year plan, all of which is designed to uh, place China in a position where it is not subject uh, to the vagaries of international diplomacy or tensions, but leaves it in a very self-sufficient manner. And that is, in essence, I apologize for my dog, that is, in essence, decoupling. And that is what China is trying to do with respect to the the sanctity, if you will, of its own economy. It doesn't intend to leave the world. China wants instead, as I noted, to increase the dependency of other uh, uh, countries on the Chinese market. But this creates an extremely uneven playing field uh, and, uh, as China's explicit in saying, leaves China with all the leverage. And that leverage, in turn, helps to insulate its internal economy, helps to insulate whatever activities it wishes to undertake from international opprobrium as China gains increasing economic strength as against those countries dependent on it. Orville, do you want me to come in here? Yes, yeah, pick it up. I mean, should we be decoupling? Is this just a phenomenon or a policy, Evan? Uh, Well, it's a little bit of both. Um, I agree with Charlene. There are pressures for 
decoupling or detachment. Uh, they're limited, they're incremental. Um, what's interesting about the Chinese approach is, of course, the fact that the Communist Party uh, can simply dictate the direction that both the private sector and the state sector te- take in terms of it, their economic relations. So if the Chinese choose to decouple faster, uh, they certainly have the capability to do so. Um, and I think Charlene's point, <clears throat> key point is worth reiterating. The Chinese want to move their economy from a situation of complex interdependence now, where they face a variety of vulnerabilities, uh, to a situation of asymmetric dependence, where it needs others less, others need China more, and then China will turn around and use that asymmetric economic dependence for the purposes of political leverage, right? And, you know, in in an immediate sense, that could be about reducing um, for China, its exposure to global markets in case there's a conflict over Taiwan and it wants to, you know, minimize the short term hit to the Chinese economy from major military action against Taiwan. Right. I mean, you could imagine a scenario where reducing economic dependence on external markets and relying more on domestic demand and domestic producers you know, has that sort of positive strategic, you know, uh, impact. You know, the challenge with that approach is it runs against some of the directions of China's economy itself. Um, Charlene knows far better than me the trajectory of financial sector reform in China and the fact that Chinese capital markets, debt markets, equity markets are opening up more to foreigners, and they're allowing more two-way flow of dollars and renminbi. So at the same time that they're they're seeking to implement this approach of dual circulation, right, reducing vulnerabilities, they're actually gradually liberalizing their capital account. They're gradually opening up their capital markets to foreign influence, which will create all sorts of... um, Uh, vulnerabilities for them. And as we all learned in the Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s, that money can move really fast in response to international events. So I think that the the decoupling or disengagement theme is going to be with us for a while because the Chinese are going to find that on questions of financial sector innovation, which of course is critical to rebalancing their economy, uh, to improving their social safety net, on questions of technology, it's going to be hard for them to disengage because the Chinese are part of a global ecosystem, you know, to date. I think for the United States, one of the critical conversations we need to have, uh, both in public and in private, is on this question of technology decoupling. And are there, number one, a, a variety of sectors and or choke point technologies in sectors where the United States simply has to develop a homegrown capability. It can't let itself be vulnerable to suppliers from abroad, right? The other conversation we need to have is, are there certain capabilities, AI, quantum, uh, life sciences, biotech, and of course, semiconductors, where uh, gaining and maintaining relative advantage may actually not be enough that the U.S. simply has to have absolute advantage. Um, I don't think we, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's a um, discussion that the country needs to have, but all of those issues are raised by decoupling. But because of economic imperatives, because of uh, national security imperatives, technology competition imperatives, there clearly is going to be uh, some economic, technological disengagement between the United States and China, because in an era of um, complex, comprehensive competition, um, I think both sides feel that there are current vulnerabilities uh, that don't serve their interests. Over to you, Orba. So actually, let's go to Susan, who I believe also has a question. 
Yes, well, um, I'd like to ask all three of you, uh, again, starting with Charlene, uh, to say a little bit more about the recent CCP and Chinese government crackdown on private sector, especially the private sector in internet service businesses, but ranging beyond that actually to um, uh, to the after school tutoring, to um, even real estate, uh, and how how you see the private sector and the relationship between Xi Jinping, Communist Party, and the private sector. Is this something that international investors as well as the US government should be even more worried about? Charlene? So it's, a, it, I mean, look, your, your question is a very comprehensive one. Um, let me just say uh, how uh, I think about it. Uh, these are new developments. And so as a group, we've not really thoroughly ventilated them. So I don't mean to commit the group uh, uh, to anything I'm about to say. I think Xi Jinping has in mind a longer term strategy uh, to change the development trajectory of China, uh, both its economy and its society. And I think the uh, crackdown, the themes of common prosperity, the notion of the unproductive use of capital versus the productive use of capital, many other initiatives uh, that are recent, relatively recent, tie in to what I think is this longer term, quite comprehensive vision. Uh, and so I think of four buckets. First bucket uh, is that uh, I do think China wants uh, a more economically egalitarian uh, society. Not that there won't be rich and poor, there will be, but greater, uh, sorry, lesser uh, income inequality in particular. Uh, and this is a goal, of course, of many nations, including uh, in the United States. Uh, and so there are a variety of programs and ideas. This involves, to some extent, tamping down the private sector, tamping down the rapacity with which the private sector often operates, ensuring that resources are allocated to their most productive societal use, common use, if you will, under the direction of the common of the common, which is the party, the party. Uh, second bucket, I think, is to establish, and in some cases reestablish, state authority over, and in some instances, absolute control over private uh, uh, and public enterprise. Um, and there are a variety of reasons why I think this is happening. Uh, so this is the tech crackdown and the education, cra other crackdowns. But I think in particular for larger companies, I think there's a great concern about competing pockets of influence within China uh, as being uh, not conducive to this longer term aim. There is the view of data, who data belongs to. Clearly, from the point of view of China, it is the states, not individual companies. It is the notion of um, wealth accumulation, what is appropriate, what is not, this notion of enforced ph philanthropy and so on. Again, uh, touching on the egalitarian theme uh, and the reallocation of resources. In the case of tech, away from internet service providers and so on, which the Chinese don't view as all that innovative anymore and toward hard innovation, particularly in the manufacturing sector. Third bucket, I would say, is a populist bucket, which is to say part of that's political. Obviously, Xi Jinping wants uh, unlimited term, um, but part of it also is to ensure that society has common threads that bring it together as a Chinese society with the same kinds of aims. Um, 
And I think the fourth, which is perhaps, and, and Wynne Lord certainly can comment on this one, cultural rectification. And I think what you see in the crackdown on, uh, uh, on education, on entertainment, some of these other areas, uh, first of all, trying to inculcate a set of behavioral norms, kind of social, a bit of social engineering. Second, I think, to ensure that Western influences in particular are vastly reduced. This is certainly the case in education and in control of curricula, so on and so forth. Uh, but also, uh, again, to try and ensure the notion that people feel we're all in this together in some a grander way. So bottom line is, I think all of this remains a work in progress. Uh, uh, and the outcome of any of this, of all of this, is right now, I think, very unclear. But I do think there is a top line theme here that's sitting there. I may not have identified it quite right, uh, but there is a top line theme. These are not random actions. Thanks, Charlene. I'm gonna to turn to a couple of questions from journalists and I'll synthesize them um, as, as time is somewhat short. So one question is, China says it will not seriously engage with the US until Washington changes its attitude on core Chinese issues, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Xinjiang. Given that the US is highly unlikely to change its attitude on these issues, what is a realistic path forward for US-China relations? And drawing from another question, how significant was the Biden-Xi telephone call last Thursday, September 9th? Um, Winston, since you've had a very long history in um, dealing with China, including at times when relations were not exactly warm at the beginning, what are your thoughts on this? Yes, my, my name is Winston Lord. I'm also uh, on this panel. Uh, <clears throat> first on the phone call, I think it was useful to, to touch base. We've got to have some guardrails at this tense moment in our relationship so that we don't, through accident or miscalculation, spill into conflict. And I'm sure Biden combined uh, firmness with the willingness to look for where we could cooperate uh, and try to uh, prevent miscalculations. Miscal uh, I don't have much more to go beyond that because I don't really know what transpired in the phone call, but I think it was a, a good uh, idea because at lower levels, uh, whether it's Secretary of State, Deputy Secretaries, and other meetings, national security advisors, we put one into a, a stone wall with China in terms of uh, any genuine uh, communication. Uh, but on the broader question, the first part of it, uh, we have to be firm on issues like the ones you suggested in, in the question. Uh, China is going to cooperate when it's in their self-interest in any event. So whether it's climate change or pandemics, uh, they're going to have an uh, incentive to work with us, whatever we do on these other issues. And we shouldn't let them condition our cooperation when it's in their self-interest to do it in any event. It doesn't mean we have to be belligerent across the board. We should seek out areas as I've suggested, of cooperation. But China's thuggishness abroad uh, demands some firm responses. So I have no problem with, I think, uh, approximately the right policies on the issues you mentioned. Thank you. Um, another question is, um, you know, Charlene, you uh, mentioned that no one should assume that China will fail at the Belt and Road. But at this particular moment, given what the goals appeared to be when Xi Jinping first declared the Belt and Road to be a, a, a policy for uh, China in 2013, and it was enshrined in the Chinese constitution, to what extent do you think China is succeeding on its own terms with the Belt and Road and creating a community of common destiny, a win-win for itself and uh, its partners, or was that would you argue never really the actual goal in the first place? I think a lot of the rhetoric uh, is lofty. I wouldn't look at the rhetoric. I would look on the ground. Uh, there's no question that investment in Belt and Road has slowed. That was beginning actually to slow before COVID, certainly during COVID, uh, leaving many of the donee countries 
uh, uh, in terrible financial straits and wanting to spend more time with China on debt renegotiation than on consideration of new projects or even completion of projects that were already on hand. Where I see uh, the most successful aspect of Belt and Road, however, is the build out of 5G. It is the use of Huawei and Chinese companies, Chinese standards uh, for connectivity across a vast swath. Uh, not only of the Central Asian nations, but African nations, some Latin American nations and others, uh, which is of great advantage to China and uh, of some disadvantage to the West to the extent the West can't begin to rectify the imbalance. And uh, to my mind, uh, because connectivity uh, of uh, telecom is the most cost efficient kind of infrastructure one could put your money behind uh, with the greatest possibility of a return on investment. That's really where we should be looking. As for the rest, there's no question this is a Xi Jinping uh, signature initiative. It's not going to be abandoned, but it will slow. It will have to reorganize a little bit, readjust to new reality on the ground and to some antipathy toward uh, the Chinese way of doing business. Thanks. Uh, Evan, would you like to add anything on that question? I agree with Shirley. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, so there's a, a, a trade question. Uh, how should the USTR change its approach to phase two trade deal talks relative to the path it was on under the Trump administration? What would be your recommendation to the Biden administration with regards to reports that it is considering additional Section 301 punitive tariffs on imports from China? Uh, I, I hate to respond to this because this is the, uh, I am talking way too much. So perhaps there's, there's someone else on the panel that would like to, to chat. Nobody else qualified. I know. We all want to hear what you have to say, Charlene. Right. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, Look, it's the view of the group that uh, did both the technology and uh, uh, economic uh, economy papers. China is not going to change the fundamentals of its economic system other than on the margins if it has to. It believes its economic model is successful for it. It is willing to sacrifice efficiency for what it perceives to be national security interest, and therefore arguments that the Chinese economy is operating less efficiently than it otherwise should uh, tend to fall flat. There's no question China has a demographic challenge uh, ahead of it. There is also no question that China's uh, productivity uh, has been uh, uh, is, is actually very low relative to the size of its economy. And therefore, uh, it has to uh, hope that new technologies will ameliorate the demographic problem and will help increase overall total factor uh, productivity. Uh, so uh, in that regard, telling China that it has a demographic problem and must change its model entirely also falls uh, flat. Uh, so the question for the US is, what is it that you do? Uh, you have a relatively intransigent player in the global economy that's a major player of major scale. Uh, and uh, do you continue to harp on structural change? Sure. Should you expect it to occur? No. Uh, and so, uh, what is it then that, that you uh, do? Well, uh, it's partly what the Biden administration is doing, self-strengthening. Put China aside. The U.S. needs to be as strong as it can possibly be. It needs to be a country as successful as it can possibly be because success uh, yields adherence. Uh, more than anything else, success yields adherence. Uh, and so investing in the United States, strengthening our alliances, doing the things that have made the United States strong are things we should be doubling uh, down on. The other 
with respect to China, if we add China to the equation, help to change the environment in which China operates. If it doesn't want to change its economic system, at a minimum, make it cost something to China for persisting in a system that's antithetical to market economics and global norms. Uh, And changing the environment in which China operates means, uh, for example, doing a digital services agreement with rules wholly different from China's, but rules that are supported by almost all developed economies in the world. Uh, it's, It's making the environment maximally conducive to U.S. interests and minimally conducive to China's interests as those interests are made apparent through China, Chinese policies. And do you negotiate a phase two? Sure. Uh, as I say, harp on the structural issues. There'll be some changes at the margin, but also harp on the areas you know China can change. Some of the internal regulatory features, uh, the discrimination against companies, uh, so on and so forth. Thank you, Charlene, and time has flown. This is all the time we have. I'd like to thank all our panelists for your insights on this critically important set of issues. I thank you to the journalists who have joined us, joined us via Zoom and sent in questions, and to each of you who devoted an hour of your day to better understand the challenges and opportunities presented by this juncture in US-China relations. This new report is available in full on the website of the Center on US-China Relations, it's at asiasociety.org slash center hyphen US hyphen China hyphen relations. And it's also on the website of the 21st Century China Center, which is china.ucsd.edu slash policy, policy slash task force dot HTML. We are grateful to the Carnegie Corporation for its generous funding of this and previous task force reports. If you're interested in all things China, join us next month for a live webcast on the incarceration of ethnic Uyghurs in China's Western region of Xinjiang. The session will feature anthropologist um, Darren Byler, who's author of In the Camps, China's High-Tech Penal Colony. He'll be in conversation with our online magazine, China Files editor, Susan Jakes, and with Jessica Batke, who leads the China Visibility Project at China File. It has, upon other things, reported itself on high-tech surveillance in Xinjiang. You'll find more details at chinafile.com along with articles and analysis aimed at promoting an informed, nuanced, and vibrant vibrant conversation about China. China Chinafile is published by Asia Society's Center on U.S.-China Relations. Thanks again for joining us. We hope to see you at future events.